Okay, so now we've learned about the requirements for aromaticity, which includes uninterrupted cyclic conjugation, and as part of that planarity, and then this magic number of electrons. And it turns out that as long as you satisfy these criteria, almost anything can be aromatic. Okay, so we can see some fairly unusual situations. For example, uh, tropillium ion. So this is an example where we have six pi electrons but it actually occurs in what you might call a seven carbon box. So what you do is you, uh, you might have a precursor, so a cycloheptatriene uh, with a chloride ion, right, or some leaving group, it doesn't have to be chloride. And what this can do is it can ionize to give you a cycloheptatrienal cation, okay? And it turns out then that once you do that, you in fact have a p orbital at every single carbon but the total number of electrons is still six. So we have a cationic system um, it, with six pi electrons fully conjugated, and it turns out that tropillium ion is in fact aromatic. Now this is actually first prepared by uh, Doring in 1954. Uh, interestingly, he was a faculty member at Columbia up until 1952, and then he moved to Yale when he did this work. <clears throat> but so tropillium ion was quite a landmark because um, it showed that in fact uh, benzene wasn't necessarily um, some special situation, that in fact as long as you fulfilled those requirements of aromaticity that Huckel had laid out, um, you could even have an aromatic system in the context of um, a, a cationic system. Okay, so that's quite interesting. So of course, I think you all recognize at this point that carbocations are usually highly reactive. But in this case, we have a carbocation, but it's part of a very stable aromatic system. And so it turns out that tropillium is actually stable enough that you can actually put it in a bottle. It, it's stable enough to be isolated, put in a bottle, and in fact, it's even commercially available. So you can buy different uh, tropillium salts uh, from uh, Aldrich, among other companies. Okay, so <clears throat> let's look at the molecular orbital diagram of tropillium ion. So this is the frost diagram, okay? And so again, to build this up, we have our zero bonding line. We have a circle, which is centered on that line. And then in this case, since we have seven p orbitals that we're um, combining to make this molecular orbital system, um, we're going to inscribe a regular heptagon, right? Seven-sided polygon um, in the circle put a um, energy uh, molecular orbital at every single vertice. Uh, and then in this case, we, we still only have the six pi electrons that we would have with benzene. And so they go two into the lowest and then two into, into the next degenerate um, pair of orbitals. And that's all there is. And, and again, you can see that all six electrons are paired um, and they're all in very stable bonding orbitals. And so we can see that tropillium is in fact an aromatic system um, according to the frost diagram. Okay, we can also do sort of the opposite. We can put the same six electrons in a five carbon box, okay? And uh, to do that, uh, we're gonna take a precursor, cyclopentadiene, and in this case, instead of ionizing, we're actually going to deprotonate. We're gonna lose a proton, and that pair of electrons that was in that carbon-hydrogen bond is then going to be um, an, an anion Right, but uh, it, you would understand now that it's not going to be localized on that carbon as you would have with a normal car normal carbon ion. Um, it's actually going to be part of this entire planar conjugated system. And so, a better way to write that might be uh, to show the, the little donut with a minus charge inside of it. So this is called cyclopentadienyl anion, and in fact, this is an example of an aromatic. Okay, and we can see the impact of the stability of the aromaticity of the cyclopentadienyl anion uh, by looking at the acidity of the precursors, okay? So it turns out uh, the, the right comparison here would be cyclopentadiene and then uh, this uh, basically 1,3-pentadiene, uh, okay? So it's the acyclic version of this molecule. And it turns out that the cyclopentadiene is 10,000 trillion times more acidic than the acyclic counterpart, which is really an astonishing increase in acidity. And that can be ascribed directly to the aromaticity of the conjugate base you get once you deprotonate both of these. So here, if you deprotonate pentadiene, you're going to have an anion that's a little bit stabilized by conjugation, 
And so it's certainly more acidic than you would expect pentane to be. Um, but it pales in comparison to the increase in acidity you get from cyclopentadiene. Um, and that's because the anion gets to achieve aromaticity. And so it's actually relatively quite happy to give up that proton and become an anion uh, because it's offset by aromaticity. <clears throat> okay, and so if we look at the frost diagram of cyclopentadiene, in this case we're building up five molecular orbitals. So here's our circle, um, and we inscribe a regular pentagon here. Um, and so uh, again, we still have the six pi electrons, um, and so the first two go into the lowest uh, energy orbital, and then the next four uh, go into that degenerate pair of molecular orbitals. And again, you can see all the molecular orbitals are uh, in the, the bonding um, uh, portion of this diagram, and they're all paired up. So cyclopentadiene anion, which is often called CP, um, is aromatic. It's an aromatic anion. Okay, how about if we get crazy? Uh, what if instead of um, uh, six pi electrons, we, we try to do a, a different Huckel number. Uh, and I apologize for the error here, this should, should not be cyclopentadiene ion. We're gonna deal with two pi electrons. We're gonna deal with something called the cyclopropenium ion. So in this case, again, we're gonna uh, have something that's going to ionize and take its electrons with it to leave behind a cation. So in this case, it's a cyclopropene with a leaving group attached. If this ionizes, you get to this three carbon conjugated system. So p orbital at every carbon with a cation. Okay, so there's two pi electrons in that system. We might draw this uh, in this way with a tiny little donut and a cation, a plus charge inside of that. And that's called the cyclopropenium ion. And it in fact is an aromatic. So this is actually a very important um, uh, moment in organic chemistry. Um, and uh, this again was done by Ron Breslow who we just learned uh, coined the term anti-aromaticity. So Breslow also was the first person to prepare a cyclopropenium ion in 1957. And this was a real landmark because this uh, cyclopropenium ion was the first aromatic to be made that had anything other than just six pi electrons, right? So up until this point, theoretically, Huckel had said, well, all of these things with 4n plus 2 pi electrons should be aromatic, but this was the first case that actually demonstrated it outside of 6 pi electrons, so a very important uh, um, finding in this. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we can look at stability. Um, so it turns out that cyclopropenium uh, is a billion times more stable than uh, a simple carbocation, um, and I just, I've just picked a random uh, set of cations to compare this. We could do any number of different ones and the point would be made. Um, this value here, you don't have to worry much about this. This is just a, a physical measurement of cation stability. It's called PKR plus. Um, and what you can see here is uh, I've compared the triphenyl methyl cation, which is called tritle, uh, versus um, sort of this cyclopropenium version of that. So tris, uh, or triphenyl cyclopropenium. Okay, so two cations that, are, that look somewhat structurally similar, with three phenyls, um, but one has an aromatic ring here. And you can see by the numbers here that there's a nine orders of magnitude difference between these two. And the, that difference is due to the aromaticity of the cyclopropenium ring. Okay, so that's what aromaticity gets you, stable carbocations. <clears throat> now here's the frost diagram of cyclopropenium. This is the simplest one. So we have a circle, we put a equilateral triangle in there, and then at each vertice is a molecular orbital. In this case, we only have two pi electrons to put in, so they both get to go into that most stable, most symmetrical orbital. And of course, that's a, that's a very stable orbital, right? So that's completely bonding um, around all atoms, and so of course it's gonna be stable. It's very much below um, the non-bonding level. And so two electrons, they're fully paired in a stable bonding orbital, and cyclopropenium is aromatic. Okay, uh, and now I, I would just point out that um, this was um, uh, somewhat, well, more than somewhat, it was very surprising, I would say, because not only are we dealing with a cation, okay, um, which tends to be very reactive, but we're dealing with a system with an enormous amount of ring strain, an absolutely huge amount of ring strain to, to get these three uh, carbons to bond together. And then in addition, you're asking it to be cationic. 
Um, so it wasn't clear before this was made that this even could exist. But it turns out that not only can it exist, but it is actually quite stable. Um, and there are examples of psychopropenium ions that are, that are very stable, even in water aqueous solutions. And so, um, again, that's the power of aromaticity. It, it can override a lot of very energetically unfavorable situations because the aromaticity itself is so favorable. Okay, so moving on, um, uh, we can talk about uh, other aromatics um, that involve uh, atoms other than carbon. So uh, as we learned in the first video, these are called heteroaromatics. Okay, so one example would be pyridine. All right, so this looks very much like benzene, okay, except that there's a nitrogen in, in uh, replacing one of the carbons. So again, I'll just remind you our um, sort of cartoon uh, picture of uh, the, the orbital situation in benzene, where each carbon is donating one p electron to this conjugated pi system, um, along with a single electron. Okay, well, we can have the exact same thing with pyridine, right, except for that instead of one of those carbons, we've got a nitrogen. That nitrogen is also going to be um, donating a p orbital to this six atom conjugated pi system, so p orbital and a single electron. The difference here is that with benzene, uh, that carbon uh, had a bond to a hydrogen, so each carbon has its own hydrogen. In the case of nitrogen, right, we're going to have a lone pair instead, right? So it, it's already engaged in, in one, two, and then uh, overall a third bond um, in period, and you can see that in the picture here, so one, two, three bonds, which then leaves a lone pair left over. So in the case of pyridine, that lone pair isn't needed for aromaticity, um, and so it's actually orthogonal to the pi system, okay? So this is the important part about pyridine. There's a lone pair uh, in a perpendicular sp2 orbital here, okay? Um, and so what that means is that the lone pair of pyridine's nitrogen is not engaged in aromaticity and is thus available for reaction, okay? So pyridine is basic, okay? We can see that if we look here. So uh, pyridine can be protonated on that nitrogen quite easily, and this uh, leads to a, uh, a, uh, a pyridine salt, which is, this is called the pyridinium ion, just because it's cationic, okay? So that's a, a basic nitrogen with the pKa um, of about five. So it's somewhat in the region of um, acetic acid, actually, this pyridinium. So the take home message here, the thing for you to remember, is that the lone pair of pyridine is available and it's ready for action. Okay, so it can be protonated, it could also be alkylated, and it can engage in, in other types of reactions. Okay, let's look at uh, another heteroaromatic that include, incorporates a nitrogen. This is one that's called parole. Okay, so now it's a five-membered ring, and things are just slightly different here. So in this case, we have four carbons, each with a p orbital and a single electron, right? So that, that gives us four pi electrons, and we need two more. The only place for those to come from is from the nitrogen. So in this case, nitrogen is actually going to donate uh, two electrons in a p orbital, right? So the lone pair of the nitrogen in parole is actually engaged in aromaticity, okay? And the point here then is because that lone pair of nitrogen is part of aromaticity, it's part of the stability of the system, it is not available for reaction, okay? So parole is not basic, right? If you throw a proton at parole, you will not protonate the nitrogen because to do so would result in a loss of aromaticity, all right? And so that's the important uh, difference between uh, those uh, pyridine and parole, um, and uh, you're going to want to you're going to want to remember that. Um, uh, and so we could think about this in a slightly um, more uh, schematic way, I suppose. Um, pyridine, or, sorry, parole has this lone pair on the nitrogen that's part of the pi system, and so we could, uh, in theory, draw that in, in this sort of resonance form where we have our little donut. No one ever does this, by the way, um, but if it, if it helps you conceptualize what's happening, that's the situation we've got. And the analogy to be drawn here is with the cyclopentadienyl anion, right? So in the, remember in the CP anion, um, we talked about deprotonating that carbon to give an anion at that carbon, but that, that, uh, that lone pair on the carbon, uh, that anion, 
is uh, delocalized throughout the whole system, which gives us the aromaticity. And that's the exact same idea um, with parole, that that lone pair um, is going to be delocalized throughout those five atoms to give the aromatic system.